Welcome in Christ our Savior, those here in person, those joining us online. We've got things all decorated here. This is a season of Advent as we prepare for Christmas and prepare for Jesus' second coming also. What a joyous time. Today in worship, we're going to also introduce a new liturgical song, not, not new words, but a new melody. If you have a service folder, if you turn to page 11, and if you don't have a service folder, you could take one of those blue hymnals and open it up to page 202, page 202 in the front. And we're going to look at this uh, new musical setting of the Lamb of God. The choir will sing it first, and then we'll do it again where all of us sing it too. And each time there's a little introduction beforehand. So we'll do that again. We'll all join in singing. This is the first Sunday of Advent. For a thousand years, Christians have used the Palm Sunday Gospel, spoken that this first Sunday of the church year, just as the people praised Jesus as he came to Jerusalem, so we praise him. Again, looking ahead to celebrating Christmas and looking ahead again to his second return in glory. That's reflected in our opening hymn, Prepare the Royal Highway, hymn 302. The choir will sing stanza one. We'll join in singing the rest of the stanzas.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sin. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Sunday of Advent, we look to Jesus coming. We remember his first coming at Christmas, we look ahead to his second coming. Isaiah, thinking ahead to the idea of the Lord God coming to earth, at first wanted God to come and punish his enemies. Then Isaiah recognized his sin, the sins of God's people. But then he looked to the Lord and recognized that he would endure in the day of the Lord's coming. This will be the basis for the sermon, our first reading from Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given, given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Do not
not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The choir will sing this anthem, welcoming the Lord God. In our second reading, the Apostle Paul reminds us of why we can be confident that we will be welcomed by our Savior into our heavenly home. We read from 1 Corinthians 1. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If the young children would like to come forward, I have a brief children's message to share with you today. Thank you. If you want to just kind of make a circle, come over here. Thank you. Very brave. Everybody coming up. Thank you. Very good. All right. All right. You want to come over this way? Come over to this side? Come over to this side? There we go. Thank you. All right. Very good. Yeah. You can just sit down on the ground if you want there. Thank you. All right. Got a couple more coming. It is so great to see you. Can you face me? Can you turn toward me? Thank you. 
It is so great to see you all today. So good that you could be here. You can make it here. I am so excited. Are you excited? Yeah. You see all the decorations? We're going to be celebrating Christmas. What is Christmas all about? You know? Jesus' Jesus's birthday. Are you ready to celebrate Jesus' birthday? Yeah. yeah. What are some things you're going to do for Jesus' birthday? Yeah, we can. We're going to Oh, good. All right. Good. Anybody else? What are you going to do for Jesus' birthday? Nobody? Anybody going to put a tree up at your house? Yeah, you might, some of you. I don't suppose, are any of you, you think, this is wild and crazy, you think you might get a gift for Christmas? You think you might get a gift? Yeah, I bet you get a gift right for Christmas. You give gifts for Christmas. We do that for Jesus' birthday. Anybody going to have a big meal, you think, for Christmas? Yeah, you probably will, right? Some good things like that. That's a great thing to celebrate Christmas, Jesus' birthday. There are other times that are really cool to celebrate, too. I have a ticket from something I got to go to just this past month. It was a big concert, thousands of people there in this huge, huge hall, and it was really cool. I especially liked it because one of the people singing was one of my sons. He was just one of the people there. He got to sing some solos there in that big concert, and that was really special. Maybe you would get to go to some big concert or a big basketball game or a big football game, something like that. Maybe you'll get to go to one of those some days. Those are pretty special, and you need... You need a ticket to get inside. In our gospel, I'm going to read for a minute, it's from Palm Sunday. And Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and he came in a big procession, like a big parade. He came riding on a little horse there, but all the people were taking palm branches and waving them, and they were shouting, Hosanna, which means praise God. Can you say that with me? Hosanna. That's what they were shouting out to Jesus as they welcomed him, their king. Well, as great as that was, as great as the concert I went to went, was great, or, or as great as a basketball game or other concert you might go to might be, as great as Christmas will be, there's something even greater. There's going to be a time that's even better than that, and that's when Jesus comes back to this earth. Because when he comes, he's going to come with all his glory, with his angels, and they're going to gather us up, and we're going to, he's going to take us to live with him forever in heaven. And that's going to be perfect. That's going to be so much fun. That's going to be beautiful beyond anything you could imagine. And the great thing is, you can be sure that you are going to go to heaven. In the scripture reading I just read, Paul said this. He said, God will keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son. God is faithful. God made a promise to you that you're going to get to live with him in heaven, that you're going to get to join with all other believers that day. It's like God had a ticket printed with your name on it, saying that you get to be admitted to heaven. So when you think of some great things you'll do, going to an amusement park would be fun, right? Or going to a concert or celebrating Christmas. Remember that there's an even better time coming, and that's when Jesus comes to take us to heaven. Could you say a little prayer with me? Fold your hands, repeat after me. Dear Jesus... Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for taking me. And thank you for taking me to heaven. To heaven. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming forward. You can go back to sit with your families again. Please, if you would stand for the gospel acclamation and the Palm Sunday gospel of our Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Holy 
Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered, As Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Our hymn of the day, number 314, picks up the theme of our first reading from Isaiah. O Savior, rend the heavens wide. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Again, the portion of the word we're looking at is our first reading from Isaiah chapter 64. Fellow children of God, in our reading, Isaiah asks the Lord to rend the heavens and come down that the mountains would tremble before you. If the all-powerful God did come down to this earth, well, I suppose that certainly would be like an earthquake. Earthquakes They come up in the news every few years, usually in some other country like Pakistan or Turkey, but there have been some notable earthquakes in our country too. And you probably know that if you lived in certain portions of California, you wouldn't be surprised every once in a while if you felt the ground trembling just a little bit. And you'd know, of course, that those little minor quakes were just a reminder that the big one was still coming. That, of course, would be a catastrophe. And yet, I wonder if sometimes we might be tempted to think that such a t- catastrophe should come because of all the sin that's going on in this world around us. God could just put an end to it in an instant. And in fact, when Jesus comes back to this earth, he is going to destroy all immorality and all people who insist upon living their lives in that way, destroying this world and creating a new earth 
for us to live on for eternity. Sometimes we might want to say the words that Isaiah spoke in our lesson. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, Lord. Looking at others, we might desire this. But then, if we look at ourselves and if we're honest, we have to realize that we should fear the Lord's coming. But then God gives us a different perspective. We look at our Savior, and we are reminded that we will endure God's coming upon this earth. May God today strengthen our faith as we prepare to celebrate his first coming at Christmas and also as we look forward to his return to this earth on a day to come. Isaiah, he looked at the world of his day and he wanted God just to judge the whole world and be done with it. Isaiah was God's spokesman about 700 years before Jesus was born on this earth and he saw a world that was just covered in sin. And not just out there, but also among God's people. The Lord revealed to Isaiah that about a hundred years later, he was going to discipline his people by having the Babylonians come and overrun the nation there of Israel. And the people would be taken away into the Babylonian empire. Isaiah really here is voicing what the people would say at that time. That God should just come down with all of his power, wipe out all those pagan empires, and restore the nation of Israel. It could be easy for us to have a similar attitude. From all appearances, God's kingdom today, his holy Christian church, is certainly taking a beating. Sin seems to be just getting worse. More and more people reject God and his laws, live for themselves. Some even just mock God or mock his people. Some people just say that they are enemies of God. Well, if God were to rip open the heavens and come down to his earth, his enemies would certainly be in bad shape. Just imagine having the anger of the almighty God vented upon a person. Isaiah says, As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down and make your name known to your enemies and cause nations to quake before you. God would certainly set his enemies on fire. He'd leave them quaking. They'd be completely terrified. Even more than that, they would feel completely hopeless because they had rejected God, their only Savior. And if they were now going to have to stand, they'd have to do it on their own two feet. But standing before the Almighty God, they wouldn't stand for very long. As I said, Looking at other people, we might be tempted to think that God should come down right now as with all of his might. But if we stop and consider our own situation, recognize our own sinfulness, well, our perspective changes. Looking at ourselves, we must fear God's coming. Isaiah said, You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against you, you were angry. How then can we be saved? And we have to say the same thing. We know God's ways. It is his laws. We have them written down in the Bible, summarized in the Ten Commandments. And yet we keep falling into those sins, whether it is greed or lust or pride or hatred. Those sins just keep on getting the better of us each day. And of course, the same thing happened with the Israelites in Isaiah's time. And their giving into sin led to dire consequences. God doesn't just punish sin with a little fine. No, God says, your sin means you have to be separated from me completely. Isaiah noted that that's what God had done to the Israelites. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. He talks about them wasting away, melting like a wax candle. That's what it's like to be separated from God. All of us, Isaiah said, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. You know, even when we try to do good, it gets tainted by sin. Like, let's say you want to help a homeless person, and that would be a wonderful thing to do. And yet, it would be so easy to start to think, well, I did this good thing. Now, somebody should thank me for doing that. Even when we bring an offering to God here at church, we might think that now somehow God owes us something in return. Our righteous acts, they get tainted by sin, and that's why Isaiah calls them filthy rags. In the end, we have to admit 
that we deserve to be punished because we have sinned. On our own, we'd be like a shriveled up dry leaf. How then can we be saved, Isaiah shouts. Looking at ourselves, we would just fear God's arrival on this earth. But our Lord answers our cry for help. Looking at our Savior, we are sure that we will endure our Lord's coming to this earth. And not just endure it, we know that we will be blessed so richly when our God comes back to this earth. Isaiah says, you, Lord, are our Father. God is willing to be our Father, the perfect Father, always there, the one who always knows exactly what we need and gives us what we need. And, of course, the Lord knows that the number one thing that we need is a Savior. We need somebody who would buy us back from our sins, who would take them away, who would change our situation completely. And God provided that Savior in the most miraculous way. Isaiah says again, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. No man-made God, no invented religion would be like the Lord God actually works. People would say, oh yeah, they'll, they'll think that there's some God that could step in. And, and God did, of course, step in in amazing ways, like when he led the people of Israel through the wilderness and a pillar of fire there by night. When it came to saving us, how did he do it? He rent the heavens. He came down to this earth as a little baby. That's what Christmas is all about. The almighty God becoming a real human being in order to save us from our sins. He became a real baby, and not the child of a king. He became a baby there of a couple that was dirt poor on this earth. He lived his life in poverty. He never owned a house. When he rode into Jerusalem there that last week, yes, the crowds were shouting there with their palm branches and shouting Hosanna about the kingdom, but he was riding just on the lowly colt of a donkey, not some great white stallion. And less than a week later, of course, he would be put to death by crucifixion, a horrible, terrible way to die, reserved for the worst of criminals, even though he had never done anything wrong himself. Jesus did this all for our sake. He took our punishment upon himself so that he could pay for all sins of all people. And in that way, Jesus won a victory, a victory beyond our imagination. He conquered all of our sins. He defeated Satan himself. He even defeated death and hell. Christ gave up his life only to take it up again on the third day as he rose from the dead. And in his resurrection, he guaranteed that we have life. We have new life ahead of us. We Christians do not need to fear death, and we don't need to be afraid of judgment day. We know that when that day comes, Jesus is going to take us to our heavenly home. God redeemed us with a love that never ends. Isaiah said, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. The Lord God made us what we are, not just living, breathing human beings. He made us living and active Christians. The Holy Spirit has come into our lives so that we actually are connected to Christ. We are God's children now and forever, and we are actually able to live that way as God's children each day too. We heard this in our second reading. You do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus to be revealed. He, that's God the Father, will keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. Look at our Savior, and we know that we will endure Jesus coming to this earth. You know, if an earthquake were to hit our country this week, we'd probably endure it. What about the final day, when this entire earth is shaken and destroyed? Well, again, we might be tempted as we look at other people to desire that to happen, but then we look at ourselves with our sins and we start to fear that coming of our God. But then we look at our Savior, and we know that we will endure, that we will in fact endure forevermore. When the Son of Man comes to this earth, With his power, with all of his glory, with all of his angels, he will gather us together. The loud trumpet will sound, and we will be brought before our Lord Jesus. And then we can echo in the confidence of faith the words of Isaiah, You, Lord, are our Father.
Amen. Please stand. We confess together with believers around the world what our God has done and will do for us as we say the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises as you once cheered your ancient people throughout their long night of waiting and watching. Come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty earthbound goals and direct our eyes above from where you will soon come to make all things right again. Come and work in us a godly grief and a genuine sorrow over sin. Forgive us for the shameful way we have dishonored you and the shabby way we have dealt with one another. Through your mighty word, stir up in us a ceaseless yearning to give ourselves to others, as you have given yourself for us. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace, or to deprive us of times to ponder and wonder at your word. Set our hearts apart from the bustle and the clamor and the jostle of these days. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger, and keep hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We pray also for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love, and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. Lord, we ask that you would be with Carlton Clifton as he continues his recovery and has now had a minor setback. We ask that you would be with the doctors and nurses that they may provide the proper treatment for him. Bless him according to your plan for his life on this earth. And bless him with the certainty of your love now and your love always. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we keep watch, and in you we put our hope. Amen. And please, uh, if you would, sign the Friendship Register. If you leave, if you're watching online, sign the, go to the description link. You can sign in there. We'll keep you informed of things here at Emmanuel. You can support our ministry by going to our website or by leaving an offering here at the back of our church. Again, we're now in this third setting of the divine service, uh, setting three, uh, which we'll be singing through today. We continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion. We practice close communion, asking those not of our Wisconsin Synod or ELS Fellowship to please study God's word with us before joining us at the Lord's table. Please stand as we continue with the traditional words of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death, and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. and When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, as you promised, you have come to us in your word and sacrament. Help us to keep faithfully what you have fed and nourished us with today, that we may be ready and waiting to receive our Lord when he comes again in glory. Guide us to use wisely the time and opportunity to proclaim Jesus Christ now, before the day of salvation gives way to the day of judgment. Through the same Jesus, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We conclude with four stanzas of hymn 309, The Advent of Our King. God's blessings to all of you who have gathered. Again, those joining us online, too, welcome. I pray that God's word has strengthened your faith, and, of course, the body and blood of Christ strengthens us always. A thank you to those who helped decorate the church, made it very lovely for this Advent and Christmas season that we'll be celebrating for the next month or so. And as you saw, there are tables set up in the back because the meal has been prepared, and I think there's enough food that even if you didn't sign up, you can stay. So uh, please go ahead and join us if you can for that luncheon here after the service. Next, this coming week, excuse me, we have an Advent song service Wednesday night here at the church, uh, going through different Advent carols and scripture readings. Uh, then next Sunday in the afternoon, we have our Japanese Christmas service. You can come and attend that or at least help out with that if you'd like to. The following Wednesday is our preschool Christmas service, Wednesday night. And then on two Sundays from now, the 17th is our Sunday school Christmas service, one service that day at 10 o'clock. Likewise, on the 24th and 31st, also just one service too. God bless you very richly as we remember the reason for celebrating Christmas. Yes, Jesus, our Savior, Jesus, who also is going to come again to take us to our true home in heaven. Please greet the others here as you leave today.